On today's World Insights, Biden, projected winner after a hard-fought election, facing rough sailing to the White House, how to heal a divided America and ease tensions with global partners, and the China International Import Expo, a tribute to China's reform and opening up. What's next in China's global economic engagement? Here's our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight. I'm Tian Wei in Beijing. After days of uncertainty, the projections by key media in the U.S. give the Democratic candidate and former Vice President Joe Biden the electoral votes he needs to secure the White House. A victory in the key northeastern state of Pennsylvania took him over the magic number of 270 electoral college votes. As Biden continues to receive congratulations from world leaders, President Donald Trump has yet to concede the race. So will this be the start of what Biden has declared the time to heal in America? And what major changes can we expect in U.S. foreign policy once Biden takes office? Let's loop in our panelists. For the latest uh, development about the U.S. Uh, election, I'm joined in Chicago by Laura Schwartz, a political commentator who has worked uh, at the White House during the Clinton years. In Iowa City, Timothy Hagel, professor of political science from the University of Iowa. And also in Washington, D.C., Bruce Fine, former associate deputy attorney general and general counsel of the Federal Communications Commission mm -hmm. under President Reagan. Wonderful <laughs> to see the three of you. Let me start by asking all of you, who could tell me how far are we from a confirmed president of the United States of America? Uh, under federal statute, uh, December 8th is the date uh, designated when secretaries of state will certify uh, the winners in their particular jurisdictions. Okay. On December 14th, the state electors meet in their separate jurisdictions to actually cast their votes. On January 6th, the joint session of Congress counts the votes, and that probably will be the date when it will be finally and authoritatively and constitutionally end of the game for Mr. Trump. But those are the deadlines that we confront moving forward. Given that the U.S. politics has been quite a nuance uh, over the past few years, uh, Professor Hegel, how confident can we be about these uh, deadlines? Well, it doesn't look like we're going to have a situation like we had in Florida back in the 2000 election where there are recount issues. That said, we do have those lawsuits, and even if they don't seem to be particularly uh, going to be particularly successful at this point, they are going to need to go through the process. And mm -hmm. so if the process is sped along fairly quickly, then we should be able to meet those deadlines. But if there are any hiccups along the way, then it's possible that could get pushed back a little bit. But on the other hand, what we saw again in 2000 was that the Supreme Court was willing to step in and make sure that we did meet those deadlines. Supreme Court, of course, is an interesting issue, isn't it, Ms. Schwartz, uh, given the makeup of this uh, Supreme Court right now? Um, when you look at the Bush-Gore recount in the year 2000, it was within 500 votes in the state of Florida. And it was based on evidence. There was a recount. The Supreme Court made a decision. And George Bush was the victor. Gore conceded the next day before that electoral college met. Now, those are the deadlines and the timelines laid forth. But what we didn't talk about yet is the fact that when there is a new president chosen, a president-elect, and for all intents and purposes, especially with the mathematical challenge and the winning of the state of Pennsylvania for the electoral college for Joe Biden, of which he's up more than 49,000 votes, and as was mentioned by Mr. Fine, none of the legal uh, cases so far are sticking uh, with any evidence. That's when the General Services Administration, the General Services Administrator who takes care of that, who is a political appointee by Donald Trump, is able to ascertain the election that Joe Biden is indeed the president-elect. Professor Hagel, now, according to media reports, uh, certainly uh, the one around the President Trump has been talking to him about uh, the issue of conceding. We haven't seen any 
uh, gesture in that direction, though. Uh, the lawyers are already quite busy, no matter whether the lawsuits uh, really make sense or not. But uh, Professor Hegel, uh, tell me about some of the legal issues that we are facing right now. Well, basically, there's a question of what you might call voting irregularities. That's mm -hmm. not necessarily fraud, although fraud has been alleged. Uh, we're waiting to see some hard evidence of that. We have some anecdotal evidence of various people in various states, Pennsylvania and elsewhere, that are suggesting that maybe something in inappropriate happened. So call that irregularities. That needs to be investigated. But the problem for the Trump administration right now is that even if some irregularities did occur, and they're always going to occur, we hope that the, the, the difference between the candidates is large enough that those irregularities aren't going to make a difference. They did in Florida in 2000. Mm -hmm. It doesn't so far appear that they're going to this time, but they still have to work themselves out. And so uh, to the, until they do, it's understandable, I suppose, especially given Trump's reputation as a fighter, that he's not willing to concede. But I think that there will be people around him that as we get closer and closer to some of those deadlines, that they will begin to tell him, OK, it's time to pack it in. Yeah. Besides his uh, campaign team, uh, uh, Mr. Fai, it seems that uh, most of the Republican Party has remained somewhat silent or muted about the issue. That's a very interesting situation. Well, it is, and it's uh, certainly partially explainable by the fact that, unlike uh, Trump, the Republican Party in the House and Senate races did better than was expected. Mm. The Republicans gained seats in the House, maybe as many as a half a dozen or more. Uh, in the Senate, uh, it was thought that they had, I think, 11 or 12 seats up, and they might lose the Senate. That apparently is not going to be the case unless the Georgia double senatorial elections go uh, Democratic, which would be unusual. So it's very difficult for Trump to make the case that there was systematic bias against Republicans in the vote counting mm -hmm. when their congressional and senatorial candidates did better than expected. Now, with regard to the legal issue you mentioned, the most important, I think, constitutional question that was confronted in sideways in Bush v. Gore is whether or not the voting rules that are binding on Election Day are to be prescribed by the state legislature, as the Constitution directs in Article 2, or whether you could have the courts in a state uh, embellish, uh, modify the state legislative action and add days, as was done in Pennsylvania, three days uh, to the time when you could receive uh, a mailed-in ballot and have it still count. The problem with Mr. Trump, even on that score, is that in Pennsylvania, the number of votes that came in during the three-day window is mm -hmm. a fraction of Mr. Biden's victory. Uh, otherwise, the kinds of claims they're making, they didn't print our poll watchers to become, you know, look over the shoulders of the vote counters. They permitted illegal ballots to be stored near legal ballots. Mm -hmm. They still haven't amounted to proof that a single illegal vote was counted. And I think we are accustomed to having Mr. Trump and his supporters like Mr. Giuliani, who I knew at the Department of Justice, who's not been a court of law for 45 years, say, well, there was fraud. But in a court of law, you actually have evidence under oath. You need direct testimony. Right. And at present, there hasn't been any testimony of that sort showing even the irregularities that Mr. Hagel report, reported have been at all, in, in any event, you know, biased in favor of Biden. Irregularities don't have any political affiliation. Mm. Mr. Schwartz, uh, about uh, the media, uh, from no matter earlier where they were supporting uh, in terms of party, political parties, uh, they seem to have a rather united voice in terms of what they believe should be the president-elect. Um, how do you make of uh, the latest uh, development in this regard? Well, interesting, because the decision desks at all of the networks and the Associated Press, they don't collect the information, they don't base their uh, winner for the state on exit polling or anything of the sort. They take the actual concrete information that the state is releasing with full transparency. And then it's a matter of math. And even Fox News Channel, the night of the election, called the race for Arizona, which greatly upset Donald Trump and the Trump campaign that resulted with calls over Fox News Channel to say, yeah. take it back. And they did not, because numbers are numbers. I know these days uh, things are all about scenarios and how to uh, find solutions to various scenarios. New scenarios popping up, as you just illustrated. Yet, 
there's another extreme scenario that the person that's right now in the White House reluctant to go. So what would be the legal structure uh, if that were the case? And an official uh, president-elect has been announced uh, through legal means. If Mr. Trump attempted to remain in the White House after Mr. Biden is inaugurated and sworn in by the Chief Justice of the United States, he would be probably punished for criminal trespass. I do not think that the military, the Secret Service, uh, anyone else who would have access to force would defend in these circumstances. Professor Hagel, do you see it also that way? I do, uh, although hopefully it won't come to that. I, I'm normally not overly optimistic about these things, but I would think that before it came to that, any kind of thing where you, where you have to physically oust President Trump uh, to get him out of the White House, that Republicans and perhaps even his strongest supporters in Congress would come to him and basically explain the situation and l hopefully get him to understand that it's time to go. Mm -hmm. uh, this is essentially what happened to Richard Nixon back in the day in the 70s. The Republicans finally came to him and said, look, it's, it's time to go. You're creating a constitutional crisis. And basically, he gave in. Trump hopefully would do the same thing, that at some point you would realize that his efforts at this point are futile. And again, hopefully the Supreme Court or other lower courts would have made that decision pretty clear as well. Let's talk about the two political potential for these two gentlemen. One is the current uh, president. Uh, the other, of course, uh, uh, could be the new president. Well, we are not having editorial policies declaring one or the other. But uh, for President Trump, it's a very interesting situation that after the result of the election comes out, uh, there is a very little uh, partisan support for him within the Republican Party in terms of his claim that the election has been fraud and this and that. S yet he has managed to, uh, some suggest, uh, get two uh, chief justice into the Supreme Court. And also he has managed to, uh, to a certain extent, look at the House uh, votes, uh, the Republican Party having more members in the House of Representatives and likely also to remain majority if not uh, uh, something happened uh, in the Senate. So, is he, and he's been using his executive power to do a lot of things that most of the Republican Party members, particularly those in the office, are reluctant to do and put it on their own track record. So, how should we see this person and his relation with his party? It's certainly a complex one, as you basically laid out there. <laughs> and to some extent, you start talking about, well, what will his legacy be? And right now, and during his presidency, it's been very difficult for a lot of people, other than Republicans, to say, well, what things has Trump accomplished? There was such an anti-Trump attitude on a number of fronts that it was hard for, him, for anybody really to say, okay, these are the good things. Now, Trump, of course, would, would trumpet his own good things, and Republicans would mention that as well. That was certainly some of, some of the issues that were central to the current campaign. But Trump also had problems in terms of stepping on his successes, in terms of his style. And so I think people, even a lot of Republicans, will not miss that particularly. And maybe in time, people can look back and say, well, there were things that were good uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, recovery of after the lockdowns of the economy, or at least the stock market in some related fields, trying to get past that. Uh, like you say, the increase in the Republicans in the House, at least in this last time, maintaining control of the Senate. So those are good things for the party. But how the party reacts to Trump afterwards, to some extent, is going to depend on what happens now. If Trump fights his way to the very end and basically causes burning of bridges behind him, so to speak, that that's not going to go well for his overall legacy in terms of the party. Mm. Ms. Schwartz, what about for Mr. Biden? Now, uh, even if eventually he would be declared as the president-elect, he is going to face uh, quite a tough uh, job ahead, particularly with what's happening in the House of Representatives, more uh, Republican members, and then in the Senate, likely to maintain the control uh, by the Republican Party. So he's going to be a dumb d lame duck in a way. Is he going to follow Trump's uh, process of using executive order to do all the things? Or 
Uh, what's going to be the path for him and the potential for him? Well, I wouldn't write him off as a lame duck just yet. I think when we look at his record with Mitch McConnell mm. and Biden and Obama's administration getting things passed on the Hill with a Republican Senate, I do believe that there will be victories that he can share mm -hmm. with Republicans because that's how he's governed before and we have no indication that he would govern any differently as a president of the United States. And so I see him working with the majority of Democrats in the House as well as the very slim majority of the Republicans in the Senate so that they can all get wins, especially as we approach dealing with the global pandemic, the economy, and mm -hmm. other important priorities that we saw people, both Republicans and Democrats, want to be attacked and looked at from the very start. Mm -hmm. uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Mr. Fine. One of the things the Supreme Court is likely to look at is the uh, health care uh, issue uh, that uh, President Obama has been using his executive order to achieve. Now, when uh, if Mr. Biden comes into the office as the president-elect, uh, he's likely to face a very interesting situation to begin with, not to mention the pandemic, the economy, and many other things. Just politically, it's going to be a very interesting situation. Um, let me just correct um, Please. one Please. statement. Yeah. Uh, President Obama passed the Affordable Care Act through Congress. It wasn't an executive order. Okay. The issue that is now presenting itself before the U.S. Supreme Court, in fact, it's argued this week, is whether or not the repeal of the penalty for declining to get health insurance with certain coverage uh, makes the entire Affordable Care Act unconstitutional, Thank you. or whether you can sever that one provision from the remainder of the act, mm. and provisions, for example, uh, prohibiting uh, denial based on pre-existing conditions and setting ceilings on the amount of insurance to be paid for mental uh, health care, things like that, will stay. Mm. Uh, my, I have read the cases thoroughly. Uh, I do not think the court is going to hold the Affordable Care Act unconstitutional in its entirety. I think there's a consensus in Congress, given the swell of support of the American people for these other provisions, that a successor statute would pass relatively swiftly. Mm. Thank you for the correction and a very resourceful answer, sir. Uh, having said that, though, another question for all of you. We've seen the European counterparts of the United States have been expressing their attitude since uh, most of the media organizations have uh, declared that uh, uh, Mr. Biden might be the president-elect. It's a very interesting picture. Well, the incumbent president is uh, suggesting there is fraud in the election. So how do you see uh, this interesting um, attitude coming from the international community. Of course, this is only about your European counterpart. There are others who have not uh, spoken out yet. How do you see this uh, very interesting picture regarding who's the U.S. president and how the others are looking at this issue? Uh, Professor Haeckel, as a political uh, scientist, uh, Professor, I'm sure you have your views. Foreign leaders are often in a difficult situation if you're going to have a contested election like this. But they, like people in the United States, can take a look at the numbers. Uh, as uh, Ms. Schwartz was saying, that that's what it is. It's numbers, how many are outstanding, what's the, what's the evidence, and so forth. And at a certain point, they don't want to, not that they necessarily would, but they don't want to get on the bad side necessarily of uh, uh, Mr. Biden in the sense that if they wait too long, then maybe he feels hurt to some extent. And perhaps many countries, for the leaders in particular, that were not keen on uh, Mr. President Trump's style are maybe happy to see him go and so are eager to uh, welcome a new president in. And so it's, you've got to play that game a little bit too. And, and especially if they think that Trump will be uh, will be exiting the White House, maybe they feel sufficiently safe and it's a good time for them to go ahead and welcome uh, what they believe will be the new president-elect. Ms. Schwartz. Yes, and to, to build on the professor, even Trump's uh, friend uh, from India, the Prime Minister Modi of India, uh, opened his arms to Joe Biden as well as Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel. And I think that has really taken a toll on Donald Trump because you could see his Twitter feed just 
explode as foreign leaders started congratulating and reaching out to President-elect Biden. Uh, you know, the moment Donald Trump feels irrelevant is when he really ratchets, his, ratchets up his attacks, and that's mm. what we're seeing. So you can tell it does not sit well with him uh, currently. He still is president, you know, until January that's 20th right. and has to work with these leaders. Uh, but he just he does refuse to accept and and will let these legal challenges go forward. Of course, we're a great democracy, uh, but then he will have to accept results at some point. I don't think he'll concede or ever admit, but he'll have to accept it in the way of leaving. Mm. My last question. Also, many are curious from around the world whether there were there would be extreme actions or rhetorics coming from the current president of the United States toward the rest of the world or any part, I mean a specific part of the rest of the world. Who is going to rein him in? Is the system going to function? We've seen most of the important members of his uh, administration, the Secretary of Defense, for example, has already resigned. Uh, so at this point during this transition, are we going to see bigger danger in terms of how a president governs the country and also facing up to uh, foreign policy issues. Uh, Mr. Fine. Well, I think there surely is a risk. Uh, the Secretary of Defense was fired. He didn't resign. In fact, he was asked to resign earlier and declined to do so, and Trump sent out hmm. signals that he was going to fire him if he won a second term. Um, and there have been some uh, leaks from the New York Times that uh, Mr. Trump may be contemplating a nuclear strike against Iran, uh, which surely would be very, very dangerous to the whole world to have a nuclear conflagration. Uh, Mr. Trump is an erratic individual. He's exceptionally narcissistic, and who knows what he would do. When we had a similar situation in Watergate, when President Nixon was rather imbalanced in the waning days of his impeachment ordeal, and Secretary of Defense Schlesinger ordered the troops not to obey presidential order to attack unless it came and was rat ratified by the Secretary of Defense. And it is a of the military to disobey a clearly illegal order. And I think that's what may happen if Trump went to that bold, audacious step. I'm mildly optimistic that he will refrain uh, from doing something so reckless because he does have the possibility of a life after the White House. But it's very difficult to say, given the erratic behavior of someone who at one time recommended swallowing Clorox to solve the COVID-19 pandemic. Ms. Schwartz, same question. Well, I agree with Mr. Fine. There's a lot that can be done over 70-some odd days. But I, too, have a faith in the Joint Chiefs of Staff, our members of the military, and career governmental employees and foreign service officers that they would not let this happen. And I can only hope, though I remain disappointed, that more Republicans of Donald Trump's own party uh, don't have a sit down with him. I truly believe the way to get Donald Trump to calm down and serve out the rest of his term will be members of his family coming to him. And we know it's not going to be Donald Trump Jr. or Eric Trump, uh, but perhaps a Jared Kushner or Ivanka, his daughter, to say, let's think about life after the White House, your brand, your legacy, if you want to run again in 2024. Donald Trump cares greatly about his brand and net worth. That is something I think he would preserve over going off the handle in the next 70 days. If he knew that was hanging in the balance, he would choose his brand over the United States. Fortunately, I guess, or maybe unfortunately, Ms. Schwartz stole exactly what I was going to say, which is that you have to look at the brand. And Mr. Fine indicated that Trump will be thinking about, and perhaps people will tell him about, that there's life after the White House. And perhaps people are speculated maybe Trump, Donald Trump would run again in 2024. Maybe Don Jr. would run in 2024. And if basically uh, Donald Trump burns his bridges behind him on his way out, that's going to ruin that. Plus whatever, even if, he, if neither one of them run for politics, again, they have their commercial brands to worry about. And so I think that that would probably be the convincing uh, argument to make for Donald Trump to leave fairly soon after everybody uh, realizes that the legal cases aren't going to go anywhere.
Thank you so much for the three of you helping us to understand much better about what's going on from outside the country. Given the pandemic, it's very hard to travel uh, to different parts of the world. Uh, Laura Schwartz, uh, Timothy Hagel, Bruce Fine, really appreciate it. It's a political drama right in front of everybody's eyes in the world. Really appreciate it for your insights. And you're watching World Inside with me, Tian Wei. Coming up on our program, China's reform and opening up has culminated the China International Import Expo. What's the next stage in China's global economic engagement? This is Shanghai, China's biggest city, a global financial hub. And now, the city that hosts CIIE. A gigantic import expo China runs to share its market opportunities and contribute to world economic recovery. Join me on the sidelines of CIIE to meet smart business people and brilliant minds and be inspired by their wisdom and can-do spirit. Actions speak louder than words, even words of hope. That's what many here in China learned through the ups and downs in this modern history. After 40 years of reform and opening up, mainly focusing on learning from the others and engaging the world, now China is set to transform into a new era, increasingly opening its gigantic market to the rest of the world. That's why the annual China International Import Expo is quite an occasion. Today, its third edition has successfully come to a conclusion. Businesses are measuring their success through contracts signed and markets secured, while my panel of guests today are looking at the bigger picture, the meaning and the significance of the event. Zhao Qizheng, former vice mayor of Shanghai, a widely respected reformer. What's next for Pudong? How to lead? Uh, course, our door is open. We welcome advanced technology and strong investment from all countries to Pudong. For example, the China International Import Expo is a rare global event. The CIIE shows that we are willing to buy goods from other countries. Now it is the third one, which is far bigger and better in content compared to the first two. This year, though COVID-19 has not been eliminated worldwide, such a big event was still held here. This is a miracle in Pudong, a miracle in Shanghai, and a miracle in China. Well said. Well said. Mm. I want to know how your early experiences of working in Pudong, looking at something from scratch, from nothing, from zero mm. to a hundred, mm. and how is it contributing to your later work of China communicating with the rest of the world? What about now? I think Pudong's progress is similar to the one facing the world. It is not only about the power of China, but also the wisdom of the world. So how to tell the story of Pudong and China to the world is very important to me. I remember you said one thing that a bed in Puxi is better than a room in Pudong. Yes, there used to be a popular saying in Shanghai at the time, I would rather have a bed in Puxi than have a room in Pudong. But now things are different. Today Pudong houses are expensive, and Pudong has the best parks in Shanghai. There are also very good hospitals, so the situation is completely different now. At the time, when we wanted to tell Pudong's story to the world, we must speak very honestly. That is, how we plan to develop Pudong, also told them where the opportunities were, and we should carry out what we promised to the world. For example, we told foreign investors that in the future, Pudong would have two highways, the fastest and best internet, and sufficient power supply. Eventually, they all came true. So many investors told us, you have done what you said, so we have done what we said to continue investing in Pudong. So Pudong's plans and practices are connected, and we should not speak empty words or do nothing. It's very different now in the world. When 
Pudong was just developed. Mm -hmm. China was uh, very much a developing country mm -hmm. and also on its way up to learn from the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Now, China has become the second largest economy in the world in terms of overall GDP. Mm -hmm. um, and many look at China think you are different in the political system. Mm -hmm. So we also see other countries have been having their own problems, uh, but at the same time, they have also been having challenges mm -hmm. working with international community. So all of these factors combined, it makes it a huge difference where China is today and how to communicate with it. Do you think so? I think many countries, especially the United States, both their governments and the public misunderstand China. They're quite unfamiliar with China, so there are inaccurate public opinions about China. We need to show the real China to the world. We should tell the real story of China, not only to show the good things we have done, but also show our shortcomings. Then people will have an accurate understanding of China. They have a proper attitude toward China. I think this is a long-term task. I also think we should have a people-oriented diplomacy explaining China clearly to the foreign public. Not only the Chinese government should do that, but also the Chinese TV stations and ordinary Chinese people. Those who have the chance to interact with foreigners should tell their own stories, and those are all parts of the story of China. And views on China are actually very different around the world. We can't just look at what's been said in the United States or Europe. We should also pay attention to the views of others, such as Africa and Latin America. When hope was deemed by geopolitics and pandemic, long-term visions would make a huge difference. That's also what I learned from the third China International Import Expo. Klaus Schwab, founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, told me during my recent interview with him. He acknowledged China's commitment to higher quality reform and opening up while being an ambitious stakeholder on global issues. The Shanghai Import Expo is taking place. You were there, Professor, uh, over the past uh, two years. Uh, uh, so anything to share? Many believe uh, this is a, a rare occasion for this year when the pandemic is uh, uh, still threatening us. Uh, it is an in-person exhibition, and the exhibition area has been even expanded this year than last year. So it's quite a showcase over there. It's also uh, trying to showcase about cooperation. But Professor, do you think the message will get across? Yes, I think it will be the first big event, um, in-person event. I think it will be very welcomed. Uh, of course, uh, we have learned to do video conferencing, and we have seen that video conferencing, virtual interaction, can replace in many ways uh, coming together. And of course, this will have a major impact also in the future on uh, the travel industry. But on the other hand, I think the personal contact is very important. I, I feel uh, to really build trust, you need the personal contact. Mm. Uh, um, you have to look, uh, I see you of course on the screen, <laughs> Uh, but um, being together, um, it uh, provides uh, this feeling of, um, uh, let's say, uh, emotional, emotional, um, uh, emotional linkage. And um, so I, I see uh, an event like uh, uh, Shanghai now very important to show it's possible again. To, to come together in person. And uh, I'm also very uh, optimistic about uh, the future of the World Economic Forum because uh, many people have asked us how will it impact uh, the forum. Mm -hmm. um, I'm optimistic that um, uh, people will have a need, maybe in a little bit different ways, 
uh, to come uh, in person together again. And it will be the combination of uh, in person and virtual interaction which will make uh, interaction and cooperation particularly effective. As Chinese businesses grow, Chinese business leaders are also on the learning curve, uncovering how they can contribute to global aspirations and communicate with the world about commitments and actions. Sun Xiao, Director General of the Department of Multilateral Cooperation at the China Chamber of International Commerce, spoke to me on the sidelines of the third China International Import Expo. His organization is devoted to getting Chinese business leaders to think from a global perspective. Mr. Sun, welcome to our studio here at CIIE. Well, thank you. I'm also very honored to be here. Tell me more about how China is looking at how it could bring its business community together. Uh, one of the things people have been talking about is international economic governance, but that is a huge concept. How to make sure uh, that stakeholders from China, for example, will be able to efficiently participate. Tell me more about that. Okay. First of all, I think it is very important for the Chinese business people to get involved in the global economic governance because everybody can see the last 10 years have witnessed the, the, the stagnations of world economy and uh, there is no developing growing points so people are doubting about the traditional developing uh, methods and patterns whether something is going wrong therefore people are thinking whether we need to reform something including the reform of WTO and other uh, systems and another very important changing thing is the rising of China. Now China become the second largest economy in the world. At the same time, the, in the world trading list, the first place. So the Chinese business people is not only satisfied uh, doing good business in the world market, but also would like to do something to see whether they can reform the trading systems. That is in the same timeline of the world's call for the reform of the current system. So I think that is very important. And also the fifth plenary session of the CPP Central Committee also suggests that now China's world, uh, economic development is under a new stage, in a new pattern, and with new concept using CIE as an example. Uh, in the past, we, our opening up is mainly focused on the export. But now, CIE is concentrating on import. We would like to have our friends to share with the mega market of China. The, th the changes are similar with the Chinese business people. Many well-established businessmen, not only interested in uh, doing good business worldwide, but also put their eyes on um, global economic governance, sustainable development goals, and uh, corporate social responsibilities. These are tremendous uh, improvements, shall I say, yes. and also vision that uh, it's important, but how to do it? I think that's probably an important question. Uh, we have seen Chinese uh, companies have been rising uh, certainly over the past uh, two to three decades, but this is very fast space, fast pace growth. So how to make sure have the, having the vision, first of all, and secondly, having the right method to participate into the global economic governance. I guess that's something you from the association are thinking about every day. This July, actually, CCPIT and CCIC has published a survey on the private sector's awareness about the SDGs in China mm -hmm. together with PwC and the UNDP. What is the result? Actually, you know, 89% of the business people knows about the SDGs. That's a good number, but only 10 have done something. 38% is planning to do that mm -hmm. and the 52 actually has not done anything right now. So that is what we can say that there is a great 
potentials and the rooms for us to improve this. Actually, if you look at the global economic governance and SDG things, you will find that actually it has many things in alignment with the five major concepts of our development. The innovation, the coordination, the green, openness, and the sharing. Actually, the SDGs are very similar in with our uh, developing systems. Therefore, we actually have done a lot of things. But we just need to integrate these two so that we can make it up and we can bring our best practice in the world arena. CCPIT and CCOIC actually is doing this kind of work. We are trying to help the Chinese business people to get involved in the world global economic governance as well as all those SDG projects. And uh, we have also witnessed the rising interest of the Chinese business people in this area. What do you think are the biggest challenges so far in that regard? Frankly speaking, there are still some uh, gap needs to be met. Like what? Uh, the first, uh, the Chinese business people need to have a global sense. For example, uh, normally a Chinese uh, businessman making a speech in the international meeting, he usually tends to speak about his own company a lot. It happens a lot how much money in the past, how much money I have, how big <laughs> asset I do have. It is more appropriate for you to talk about your analysis, your thinking, thoughts about your industry in the context of the global or regional backdrop. And the third thing is that you need to find the core value of your company because the United Nation 2030 agenda actually includes 17 SDGs. You cannot join all. You need to find the right position, the right raising check for yourselves. What do you make of uh, Mr. Sun? the difficulties that the Chinese businesses might face uh, at different parts of the world uh, due to the co uh, COVID-19, of course, and uh, particularly due to the geopolitical changes uh, apparently taking place in the world. We are making interest for our friends. We lead to the win-win situation to the end. I think it will take time for them our friends worldwide will judge by themselves. The facts, the reality is the best uh, storyteller. So this is what I'm, I have for my uh, business people. And that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us, World Insight, or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tianwei here in Beijing. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching. Bye for now.